Our lecturer uh, this afternoon is the Chief of the Forest Service, uh, Tom Tidwell. Um, and just a word about the format. Uh, what we have decided to do today, just to make it a little bit more open and um, uh, give a little more time for questions and, and discussion, uh, is uh, Tom will uh, speak for a few minutes here, and then we will turn to um, uh, another esteemed colleague of mine, uh, Char Miller, who is a senior fellow with the Pinto Institute, and in his spare time is director of the Environmental Analysis Program at Pomona, Pomona College in Claremont, California. He's the William W. M. Keck, right? W. M. Keck, uh, professor of environmental analysis at Pomona College. You might know him better as the sort of leading biographer of Gifford Pinchot. And um, I think about 10 years published uh, a book that I highly recommend to you, Gifford Pinchot and the Making of Modern Environmentalism. I think back in 1963, President Kennedy went to Gray Towers and dedicated the Pinchot Institute for Conservation. You think about what was going on in our country back in the 60s. With the Forest Service, there was a need for us to be producing a lot of timber. Sustainably, but still there was a need to help this country develop, especially um, still following World War II. At the same time, people were reading Sand County Almanac from, from Aldo Leopold. People were reading Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And the concerns that were coming up about what is really going on out here? There's a, there's a need for this commodity production. There's a need for these renewable resources. Yes, the Forest Service is doing it in a sustainable way. But at that time, you know, there was emerging trends and policy implications that, um, and it really, there wasn't a lot of things that were really clear. And it was at that time the Forest Service turned to the Institute for some help. So the Institute has really helped us to be able to have someone else take an independent view of some of our policies to be able for us to ask questions of the Institute, and can you look at this? Is this the right policy for us to pursuing? Or what kind of policy? Help us to really analyze you know, some of the decisions that we made, or to provide additional information as we move forward. And as we look at where we need to be moving forward, the opportunities that we have to work with the Institute, a lot of it's going to be centered around how to deal with climate change. How do we deal with the changing of climate and the effects on the, the national forests, the, the effects on our nation's forests? Now, we're fortunate in this country to have the, the scientists that we have with the U.S. Forest Service and definitely in our institutions, our universities, our colleges. But we're very fortunate that for decades, the U.S. Forest Service scientists have been actually working on this issue. And so uh, the last few years when I get asked by Congress about, well, what shifts are you making to, um, to, to do more around climate change? And I say, well, we're just continuing what we've been doing. And that is to really study, to understand how this changing climate is affecting the vegetation. How is it affecting the systems that we're responsible for, these eco ecosystems that we're responsible for, to make sure that they can continue to be resilient and resistant into the future. Our scientists also contribute to the global climate change research. This includes the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And recently, the IPCC, they issued a report about managing the risks associated with extreme weather events and the disasters that follow, the storms, the floods. Now, according, according to this report, climate change, it's not just the gradual increase in temperatures in many parts of the country but it also affects the frequency, the intensity, the extent, the duration, and the timing of these extreme weather events. This increase in frequency of these disturbance events is really what we've, we're coming to the conclusion what we really need to focus on. Not only is it what's really going to dictate what we have to deal with during our lifetimes, but more importantly, this is what's really causing the stress to the systems. From our, what our scientists tell me is that these extreme fluctuations have more impact on the ecosystems, more threat to species viability, than this gradual increase in temperature over time. 
Our central goal is just simply to restore the ability of these systems, these forest and grassland ecosystems, to resist the climate-related stresses, to recover from the climate-related disturbances, and continue to deliver that forest-related values and the benefits to all of our citizens. And by restoration, I simply mean that restoring the functions and the processes that are characteristic of healthy, resistant, resilient ecosystems, even if it's not exactly the same systems that were there before. I can't stress this enough what a challenge this is. The things that we all learned when we went to school, the things that we learned during our careers about what is the right prescription for this stand, what's the right thing to do to stabilize this watershed, we need to recognize that what worked the last 20, 30, 40 years, 50, 100 years, may not work in the future. So our challenge is to really understand what we need to do to restore these systems, not to today, not to what they need to be today, but to understand what we need to do to restore these systems so they can deal with the stresses that they're going to face 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. The other key focus of our, our work is going to continue around wildland fire management. Fire is a key part of these ecosystems and to be able to have the planning in place so that we can allow fire to play its natural role. We also need to build fire adapted human communities and that's where we'll continue to spend a lot of time reducing the threat around these communities in places where we cannot allow fire to play its natural role with the amount of fuel that's on the landscape. So we need to get in there and mechanically treat these areas so that when a fire does occur we can successfully suppress this fire before it comes into our community. At the same time, we need to work with our communities so that they're more defensible, so that they, they implement things like what we call our firewise techniques. So when they build homes, it's done in a way that if a fire occurs in that area, firefighters can get in there and defend that home. One of the things that um, I look forward to talking to the Institute about is to help us to be able to describe, to understand this business of cost avoidance. As much as I can get up here and tell you that investment in, in green infrastructure is a good thing, doing hazardous fuels reduction will save us money when it comes to fire suppression. Being able to quantify cost avoidance, it's hard. But I also know that the more that we can quantify the benefits of conservation, the benefits of maintaining and restoring these forest ecosystems. And when we can put it into dollars and cents, it's a lot easier for people to understand that that's a good investment. So in closing, I just want to thank everyone again for first of all coming out today. But also, I want us to all understand the opportunities that we have in front of us to be able to have constructive dialogue about what we need to do in this country when it comes to conservation, what we need to do to make sure that these ecosystems that we have the responsibility to be the stewards of today, that we're doing what we need to address the effects of climate change, but we do it in a way to ensure that future generations are going to enjoy the same range of benefits that we enjoy today. The clean water, the clean air, the, the biodiversity, the recreational settings, along with all the commodity productions, the renewable energy, the renewable wood that needs to be removed from these systems so we can maintain those. We are so fortunate in this country to have the conservation legacy that the people like Gifford Pinchot, Theodore Roosevelt, really helped to establish for this country. And today we have the honor and the responsibility to make sure that we carry that out so that the next generations have that same range of opportunities in decision space about how to use these incredible resources. But the maintenance of that forest is not the same forest. I mean, I think that was part of your point earlier on, or uh, that, that what worked 100 years ago, 50 years ago, maybe even only 10 years ago, may not work any longer. That the species will change, and what we have to do within those forests may have to alter as well. And yes, and that's what they need to focus on, to understand what they're going to have to do, say, during their lifetimes, during their careers, to really stay current on the science. Right. Now, we're very fortunate in the Forest Service that we have 
our research and development branch is part of the agency. So it's very easy for us to actually not only develop the science, but then apply the science through our management. And so that helps our managers be able to kind of stay current. But the real challenge in the future is that we're going to have to be a little more nimble, a little more agile when, it, when we think about what we're going to do. We're also going to have to accept that there are certain places, there are certain um, ecosystems that we're not going to be able to maintain. I think about uh, some areas that I've worked with uh, during my career with Aspen. And we would have a disturbance event that normally would just regenerate that Aspen, but it doesn't come back. And we're, so okay, what did we do wrong? What do we need to do? But the reality is that especially you know, on southern slopes at lower uh, elevations, we've probably lost that site and we're not going to get Aspen back. So what we have to accept is say, okay, what's, what's going to be there? And focus on restoring that <coughs> ecosystem, that system, and to make sure we're doing everything we can. For instance, often when you lose, a, say, an Aspen stand, it's a great opportunity for invasives to come in. So instead of focusing on trying to bring Aspen back, our focus ought to be making sure we're doing everything to keep those invasives from coming back in or getting established. So is restoration the wrong word? No, I think it's the right word. Okay. It's just that we have to understand that it, the, it doesn't mean going back. It okay. means to, to restore the health, the vigor in these systems. And that sometimes it is to restore to the future. So there may be a better word, and I'd, uh, I'd be sure open, open to that, but it's more to understand the, the concept. But many of our systems that because of things that have gone on in the past, uh, part of it is with our, um, our fire policy in the past of putting out really too many fires, mm -hmm. you know, we've altered these systems to the point where they're not as resilient as, as they could easily be by just changing some of the things for us to change some of our management there. And so that's, that is restoring. But for some places, we have to be okay that it's restoring to maybe something different than what was there in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we spent a lot of time in this country really having a, um, a debate about is there any room, any place for active management of our forests? Mm -hmm. And we went through a period of time for a couple decades well, I can tell you that we're, I feel we're past that. And today we're having more constructive dialogue about what needs to be done and how. And because of that, there's more capacity coming to the system to really help with that. Sometimes it's just, it's people that want to help. They want to volunteer. But even more and more, there's communities that want to provide financial support to be able to do this work. The other thing is that we're doing a better job today to understand that we need to look at these large landscapes. We used to do so much of our work on some very small pieces of land. And the analysis, the, the surveys that we were required is very, very costly. Well, today we recognize that when it comes to restoring these systems, we have to look at large landscapes right. that really go way beyond our borders. So by looking at those large landscapes and applying the the analysis and then the, the work that needs to be done, that's also helping. But the other key thing is that, especially with our forested um, ecosystems, we have to maintain the infrastructure. We have to maintain the mills. We have to maintain the, the loggers that can do this work. And then we're going to have to find additional revenue streams, additional markets for this material beyond just in the past, which has been our um, the, the softwood market for the most part, or the, the um, you know, lumber or furniture. We're going to have to find other ways to be able to create additional revenue streams to help pay for the work that needs to be done. A, a quick reaction to that. Uh, how are we going to re replace or restore that infrastructure since so much of it is gone in the American West? Well, our first focus is to maintain what we have because right. of the point you just made. And, um, and part of that, uh, across the country we see these collaborative efforts that are now just almost commonplace where, where folks that used to really question the, the need for any timber harvest, any biomass removal, are now understanding the need to be able to not only do that work but to have the mechanism mm -hmm. and that that infrastructure is now becoming a key part of the solution and so through that you are seeing an increase in the amount of work that we're getting done you're seeing greater agreement around it. 
So we're maintaining this. We have problems with budgets, but you're trying to work around that in part through the collaborative process that you've described. Are there new legal strategies, new laws that ought to be written, issues that ought to be addressed uh, through the judiciary that might free up some of this? I, I'm just sort of curious. I mean, you mentioned that we seem to be beyond some of the legal squabbling that, that um, uh, rampaged through the 80s and the 90s in particular. If that's disappeared, are we at a point now where we could rewrite some of those laws to better facilitate this restorative process? For one, is this concept of stewardship contracting. Right. We've been using this for a decade now and we're gaining a lot of support across the board that it's a better tool because we can actually do all the work that needs to be done, not just the biomass removal, but the trails work, the stream improvement work. It can all be done under one contract. So it reassures everyone that hey, the part that I'm really interested in, that too is going to get done, not just the biomass. The challenge is that this authority expires this year. So when I look at some things, it's not a new law, but it's definitely a new author that's an authority that we need to get that reauthorized. Um, so there's, there's key things like that. The other thing we need to, um, I think, be um, careful with is that any new regulations or new policies, we need to really take a step back and really understand how that can affect um, you know, the management of our forests. How, it, how will the impact it'll have on private forested lands to make sure that we are not putting a regulation in place that they may have good intent, mm -hmm. but the consequences are gonna result in another forest landowner going out of business because they can't just deal with that. So another, another forest lost to a, some form of development or it'll prevent us to being able to you know, maintain you know, markets um, and new revenue streams. That's the thing that I think we have to be most careful about because we have some big challenges. I use an example when it comes to clean water. You know, nobody supports the Clean Water Act more than the Forest Service. I mean, that's it's one of the foundational principles of the US Forest Service is, is water. But at the same time, one of the best things that we can do to provide clean water is to have healthy forests. And when there's a need for some active management or some burning that needs to occur to maintain those, there may be some short-term impacts you know, to that water system. But we need to look at the long-term benefits right. because it's, it's really encouraging now that when I have a lot of discussions with folks around the Clean Water Act that I get to hear comments like, well, the best thing we can do is make sure we have healthy forests. The best thing we can do is maintain our forested landscapes because folks are understanding the connection to that. So those are the things that, that I'm more concerned about as we move forward and address issues that we need to. But we do it in a way with an understanding of the consequences to this to these large landscapes. So let me, let me follow up on some of this and then I think we'll move to Q&A. Um, the agency has contributed extensively to the National Climate Assessment Report, the recent report, um, and, you've, and you've mentioned these various ways in which collaboration and economic activity can be linked to these restorative um, initiatives of one form or another. Was there anything in that con set of contributions or that report itself that surprised you? Well, it wasn't so much a surprise. It was almost um, a welcome recognition. Hmm. And, and a couple things in it, it goes back to my comment in my opening remarks about we need to have a better understanding of how these multiple stresses come together and that we need to understand how they can overtax these ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And we can't be worried just about, okay, here's, we can expect to have longer, more intense droughts in the future, but we also have to understand then, okay, what's gonna be happening with the insect and disease um, infestation? What are we going to, at the same time, we can maybe expect more wind events. So we need to understand how this all fits together and, and not just be focused on one stressor that's, that we're seeing from this increased frequency of disturbance mm -hmm. events, but to understand how they're all related. So, you know, that's something that was nice to see that. It helps really lay it out, and I think it makes it a little clearer for what we really need to be focusing on. The other... Uh, one of the other key points of that was that the benefits, the social and economic benefits from our forested resource in this country, and that how climate change is going to affect this resource, and we need to have a better understanding 
of what the impacts are socially and economically. Mm -hmm. not, just, you know, not just in the direct jobs, but the, the things that, when we talk about that 20% of the water in this country comes off our national forests, <coughs> and if we're gonna be able to maintain that water, what do we need to do? And if, as we look at the effects of, of a changing climate on this forested resource, we need to understand really the, the reason, the driving, maybe the driving reason for us to restore these systems is probably going to be just as much driven by economics and social needs as just the need to maintain the biodiversity and these forested landscapes. So those are a couple of things that, um, that I found very important they're reassuring and very helpful to help us move forward. I have to ask one question then, because in part where we began is where we've just ended. Um, and I can, I can hear what you're arguing in terms of the complexity of these things and the interleaving of social, economic, and, and environmental. One could look at that and go, throw up your hands and go, hell no. There's nothing we can do. So in a sense, I want to know how does the agency attack these kinds of problems, break them down, think them through, and try to resolve them, even though we know in the process of breaking down, we're, we're uncoupling the very complexity that we think is essential to understanding them. Well, part of it is we're fortunate that we have an, an organization that can handle these complex issues. And I, I think about uh, all the, you know, from our research and uh, development branch of the Forest Service to state and private to our national forest system. So we can bring a lot of capacity. But the way we're approaching this is kind of to break it down so we can understand that. And we developed a, a roadmap you know, for, for our employees about how to understand the, the effects of a changing climate and what they need to do. Part of that is to do a, a vulnerability assessment to really understand what you can focus on and where you need to maybe put your first efforts. Um, the things that we, uh, we, uh, we've used a scorecard, a 10-step scorecard, so it helps our employees to be able to see that we need to continue to work in these areas so that we understand the other key part of it is to maintain the research and development that we're doing and, and if anything, to be able to move a little faster to apply that science mm -hmm. onto the landscape. So that's, that's the way that we're going about, you know, kind of breaking it down a little bit so you can keep working on these pieces. Because I have to admit, if you just look at it all and if you look at the combination of all these disturbance events coming together at any one time, it, it could be a little bit um, problematic, no question about it. But the strength that we have is not only in the capacity that we bring to the table and, and all the partners and communities that we have working together, but we also need to remember that you know, these natural ecosystems, they have a tremendous amount of resilience. What we need to do is to help them to assist that, do what we can to maintain that. Mm -hmm. And that's where I can, when I look at this, I can feel pretty confident that the things that we're doing are going to be helpful. The other thing, and it's a big challenge, that there's going to be times when we're going to, be do, we're going to have to move forward with you know, taking this action on the landscape, and we may not know for sure if it's going to work out. Right. And there's going to be some risk right. to that, and I think we're just going to have to accept it. But I look at it more as making sure what we can do, we're just going to help these systems be more resistant more, more uh, resilient in that, in the most cases, um, I think we have a lot of room to work with right there. And so I think that risk is relatively small. I believe we do have the knowledge um, to be able to know what we need to be doing today. And I also, I'm confident we have the wisdom to understand what we don't know and what we need to work on in the future so that we will have the knowledge to know what we need to do in the future. There's no question we need to do a better job, I think, not only of the Forest Service, but all the various agencies, the states, the universities, to, to do a better job to share the science, to make sure that we are aware of where the gaps are, and then to find out who's the best person, who's the best um, organization, institute to really take on that. And so that we can make sure we're not duplicating uh, where we don't need to, we're, um, but really to gain more capacity. And that, there's just no question. We got a few things we're working on there, but those are the places we can do more. And then the third part, um, you know, with that, you know, sequestration, uh, it's, uh, we'll deal with it uh, when it does come. And there's, there's no question that, um, you know, it will have some, some impacts. It, it will slow down um, 
you know, some of our key research is going to um, impact um, jobs. Um, there's going to be less work uh, going on. There's going to be less acres restored. And so, you know, it's a problem. But at the same time, you know, we accept our responsibility of needing to be able to work smarter and be able to work in different ways to help deal, you know, with the deficit we have in this country. But I'll tell you, it's, it's something that's going to um, really, really force us to do our best job to set priorities. And so, you know, we'll, um, we've we're well positioned to be able to deal with it as we move forward, but um, you know the best thing that comes out of these tough economic times is it really requires you know to be creative and innovative about how you go about our work. So if there's any any good side to these economic times, I tell you it's really helping us to build different partnerships that we we never would have I think mm -hmm. thought about in the past. You mentioned the sort of uh, rural urban. Uh, Continuum, I believe is the way you put it. Uh, we had a couple of questions here that sort of revolve around urban ecosystems. The fact that uh, so much of our population today, and increasingly uh, as we look forward, uh, will be in the cities. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of folks, I think, associate the Forest Service with the national forests, mm -hmm. and yet we have uh, um, a, a different sort of urban eco or different sort of forest ecosystem in these urban areas. Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you're using terms like green infrastructure, and what is the green infrastructure in 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 <coughs> urban areas? What role does that have to play in all of this? Well, green infrastructure is the the vegetation hopefully the native vegetation, but also in some places the in introduced vegetation that helps mitigate, you know, the impacts of these disturbance events. So it's the having the healthy riparian system that where you have the root system in place that when you have the floods, you don't lose the stream banks, you don't have all the, all the erosion that occurs from where you have a stream bank, that there's raw and there's no vegetation to hold mm -hmm. it. So the green infrastructure is the plants, it's the trees, that um, we need to make the investment in. And then when it comes to urban, you know, you're right, Al, that you know, I think it's 80% of Americans now live in an urban setting. And we are fortunate in this country that we have, I think it's 100 million acres of urban forests in our communities. So the, the, the opportunity we have is to help folks understand the benefits of that. And like I said earlier, it goes way beyond just making making your street a little bit more uh, livable, it's a nicer place. There's mm -hmm. actually strong economic benefits. So I think the more that we can make that connection, that people understand that this is a good investment. Mm -hmm. The other key part of it is that with 80% of Americans living in urban environments, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to connect with them about the importance of forests, and not just the urban forests, but the nation's forests, so that it helps build support for the investment that needs to be made in the nation's forests. If they understand the benefits of the forest in their neighborhood, the forest in their park, the forest in their city, and that helps us to then have the avenue to be able to connect with them to help them understand this larger picture. Can you help us understand how the agency does that work? I mean, what is your interaction in Denver or wherever it may be that, that allows that dialogue to unfold? Well, it, it depends on, on the community, but through our state and private forestry programs, you know, we're able to, to work directly um, in a, with our partners, but also with, with some cities to help them you know, understand what they can do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Denver, for instance, the Denver Water Board has agreed to make a sizable investment in their watershed to be able to restore that watershed because they've had to deal with the consequences when they've had a flood following a fire. And they go, there's got to be a better solution. We said yes. So we work directly with them to help them understand, let's invest in restoring the resiliency in their watershed. So the next time we have a fire, it burns less at a, a lower intensity. There's going to be less damage to the watershed. And thus, they'll have to spend less money repairing their water system. Um, in places like in New York City, where we, we had a great partnership there with, um, with New York and developed a program to help them kind of green up their brown spots throughout mm -hmm. the brown lots. So they had a lot of vacant lots. And the idea of getting them to understand that it's a good investment uh, for them to plant trees in those areas. And then al also there was a great jobs program that was associated because we were able to train people, young people from the community, from New York City, to be able to learn how to care for these trees 
and to um, you know, be able to promote that. We also have a program in Oakland, in some tough parts of Oakland, mm -hmm. where there's been a volunteer organization that's been planting trees there for years to really make a difference you know, on their streets and in their communities. And I'll tell you, when I was down there, I, I think it was, it was so gratifying to be able to go through these, these communities um, you know, and where there's, there's sign of, at times of violence and, and some um, uh, other things going on there, but they've never lost one tree to any, any form of, of, of you know, anything. So every, every tree that they've planted, except for a couple that got hit by a car from an accident, but, but nobody has um, vandalized any of their trees. Where you see other vandalism occurring, but not to those trees. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing that really, I think, makes this different. So we, when we approach the urban, we look at a variety of different ways to do it, and do it in a way that it works with the community. Right. Okay, just uh, one more question. Uh, this is relating really to sort of the international context. Uh, and uh, it relates to both research and policy. So, you know, we think of the U.S. Forest Service as having a mission to promote conservation and sustainable management of, of, of all of the nation's forests. But what role do you see the Forest Service having in um, uh, disseminating the results of, of research, particularly on climate change, with other countries around the world? And I guess related to that, uh, what role do you see the Forest Service uh, having in sort of informing or influencing in some way the policies uh, being developed in other forest countries around the world? Well, along with our domestic responsibilities, we all, Congress has also given us responsibilities to work internationally. And the first part of it is to be able to disseminate the research, the knowledge that we have, and to be able to work with other scientists around the world. We're very fortunate that we're able to have an exchange program to be able to bring scientists from other countries come here and work with us for a while and then have our scientists you know, spend time in other countries. The other, the other part of our work is what we do through our international programs where we provide the, the practitioners the technical knowledge about to help countries be able to move forward with watershed re uh, stabilization, to move forward with reforestation. And for instance, with the, uh, Peru, we've been working down there for um, over five or six years to help Peru develop forest regulations so that Peru will be known as a country that practices sustainable forests you know, throughout that country. And not only is there the direct benefits you know, to um, our timber industry in this, this country, but the benefits that will will come out of that for the entire world because you know Peru has the, I think the majority of the Amazon headwaters mm -hmm. and so by sharing not only our, just our knowledge but also our experiences you know we've been around now for over a hundred years and we've learned a lot and we've made our fair share of mistakes and we want to be able to share the things that we've learned with other countries so that they can maybe move a little bit faster than we did to understand what they need to do. The other key part of it is with technology exchange. Some of the things that we've developed over the years to help us to do a better job to do our inventory of our forest resource, to be able to share those resources in a way with, with countries so that they can quickly develop an inventory um, that hopefully someday will be similar to what we have in this country through our forest inventory and analysis. But there is a uh, this is a very important role that I think we have to be able to share this expertise and work with these countries. But at the same time, we all learn. And whether it, we're working in, in uh, Peru or in the Middle East or, or in, with Russia, we also learn about how we can do a better job to move forward to restore these systems. Because when we talk about this changing climate, no matter what we do in this country with our forested resources, there is so much more that we can do throughout the world if we can be working together and really promoting sustainable forestry and helping every country understand the benefits of maintaining their forests. So those are some of the, you know, the direct and indirect benefits that we have from our international program. Excellent. Do you have any follow-up? Well, that's great, Tom. Thanks so much for uh, for sharing your your thoughts and 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 for bringing along some of your uh, some of your best scientists here today. These are the folks who are creating that knowledge. So, um, 
I want to thank you very much, and, and thank you, Char, for uh, sort of uh, playing utility infielder here.